Welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone had a wonderful lunch uh, and uh, looking forward to the um, afternoon's slate of panels and speakers. Um, we have a, a great lineup right now with uh, uh, with seed use as what's up next. Uh, we're just waiting for uh, our panelists to be spotlit. Uh, panelists, if you are there, if you can turn on your video, that will help us to spotlight you. And so you can join uh, Nancy, who's here. Welcome, Nancy. Um, and we are going to be joined by Andrea um, Barry, who's just here, um, and Anna Fialka. Thank you. And we're looking for Mike Whittemore as our last um, panelist, and um, and then we'll get started. So uh, as we're waiting for um, for Michael, um, just going to sort of set the stage for this again. As you've seen, we we're, we're trying to build and connect all of these different aspects of the native uh, materials supply chain. And I think we would all agree that the demand for native plant seed is really at an all time high right now. And um, there are lots of different markets through which genetically diverse and regionally appropriate seed can be used. Uh, and those range from, uh, you know, hab habitat restoration, uh, either a large scale or small scale, uh, to the smaller scale patchworks of home gardens and yards and developed landscapes. Um, and our panelists today will focus on the development of these different markets in response to consumer demands and demands from restoration practitioners, uh, municipal entities, and others. Uh, and really, uh, you know, if we can produce enough genetic, you know, quality seed, um, where should it go? Uh, and so to help answer some of those questions, I am thrilled to be joined by Andrea Berry, who's the Executive Director of Wild Seed Project. Uh, Anna Fialkoff, who is the uh, Ecological Programs Manager also at Wild Seed Project, and we had a, a really a wonderful presentation yesterday by Heather McCargo, who founded the project and kind of set it in motion, and uh, um, uh, we're further joined by Nancy Pau, who is a wildlife biologist at the Parker River National Wildlife uh, uh, Refuge, and um, still looks like we're waiting for Michael Whittemore, who is the Stewardship Manager uh, at, uh, on Martha's Vineyard for the Nature Conservancy. But uh, to make sure that we are moving forward, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and allow for Andrea and Anna uh, to begin um, their introduction. So without further ado, um, we'll turn it over to Andrea and Anna. Um, welcome. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, Uli and the Native Plant Trust for inviting Anna and I to be um, part of this panel. Um, as we go through this introduction of kind of who we are and um, try and build on Heather's presentation of Wild Seed Project, um, y'all have heard where we've been. Uh, and this is an opportunity for us to talk about where we're going. Uh, Anna and I are gonna kind of tag team through this presentation uh, slide by slide. Um, and yeah, and then we'll, we'll move through it and are excited to be part of the conversation. So Uli, if you want to go to the next slide, um, Anna, you want to give the framework of who we are and what we do? Yes. So Wild Seed Project, um, with the really great foundation that was laid by Heather McCargo and the context that was given behind why Wild Seed Project started yesterday, um, has the goal to build awareness of the vital importance of native plants and to provide people with the tools and restore biodiversity, to restore biodiversity in their own communities. So we are at our heart a uh, really a community movement based nonprofit organization. And we do this um, through several layers. Our educational programs are geared towards adult adults as well as children and youth and families. And we start with our publications that we, we put out an annual publication. Um, and in the last couple of years, it's been a, a guide on a, a 
a, tip, a different topic about native plants. Right now we're covering all the layers of native plants in the landscape that people can plant. And we do walks, talks, and workshops. And we're also embarking on a new um, youth program in which we can go into local schools in Southern Maine and become part of the curriculum to grow native plants from seed and then plant those out into living land, li living um, schoolyards that can further be for education. So um, I think this carries well into our next kind of layer, which is demonstration. And in this, we partner with local organizations, businesses, farms, uh, municipalities, and others, other entities to design and plant communities um, or landscapes that are dem demonstrative of showing what restoring biodiversity um, in the landscapes that we live, work, and play can look like. Um, so we we do this by partnering and building relationships with um, different local nonprofits and organizations. Um, and then our seed stewardship program, which I think is probably the most built out and what we're most well known for is not just about our retail arm of selling native seeds, but that is a critical piece because we sell small scale, small amounts of native seed in order to get more seeds out into the landscape, get it to be accessible for everyone. And um, we train and educate um, our staff and volunteer seed stores to go out and do the collection, the cleaning, the proper storage, and packaging of these native seed packets. And these in turn go out to our different demonstration landscapes, to schoolyards, and to community members across Maine and the Northeast. So I think um, we sell about 75 species and we've um, put millions of plants in the ground already in our just eighth year as an organization. Um, and, and we're not just about putting more plants in the ground, even though that is a great end goal. I think it's really that movement building that Andrea can speak to even more. So next slide, please. So just a little background about Anna and I. Um, so I am the new executive director taking over from Heather. Uh, I started in the spring of last year, 2021. Um, and I am not a horticulturist or a botanist or a restoration ecologist. I'm a, um, I actually have a museum background and um, as well as education, but I come to Wild Seed Project with a deep passion for um, equity and justice work and joining our organization with the climate justice movement, as well as a real focus on uh, decolonization and working with Wild Seed Project and with our, our movement around native plants to build deeper and stronger relationships with indigenous communities uh, throughout our state. Uh, and then hopefully beyond that. We are, uh, Anna and I are calling into this um, conversation from the ancestral lands of the Wabanaki Confederacy and the tribes that are part of that confederacy. Um, and that is on unceded territory uh, that we now call Maine. It is really important for us to acknowledge that Wild Seed Project and our work within Wild Seed Project uh, was founded to repair the harms of colonization. Uh, and so much of the direction that we are going with this organization uh, is in working with indigenous communities um, and sharing uh, sharing plants with, but also learning from and building on the direction that um, Wabanaki communities here in the state of Maine um, are, are encouraging us to go. So it's it, you know, we are going through a organizational shift um, to really truly position ourselves uh, in that deep relationship. Um, and I'm excited to be diving more into that through this conversation. And thank you, Andrea, for giving more context to where we work from. Um, I'm the Ecological Programs Manager for Wild Seed Project, and that means that I work on a variety of different places in the organization. I do a lot of our walks, talks, and workshops and for adult um, uh, um, folks. And then also um, I work on our annual publication. I kind of shepherd that through the process from conception to getting out to the public. Um, and then our demonstration projects with a background in ecological design and my 
uh, time as a horticulturist at Garden in the Woods, uh, which is a very, very near and dear to my heart, um, I teach through that experience and um, give, create demonstration landscapes through my experience with native plants. So um, that's what we do. And next slide. So um, we really focus uh, the central part of Wild Seed Project and how we began is in making seeds accessible. Um, we are really glad to be part of this conversation about seed use because we uh, address the parts of this work that are not focused on restoration, large scale restoration projects. We're really interested in democratizing access to seeds for homeowners, for small businesses, um, we do encourage and work with landscapers and find people who are passionate about this work to, to help them to create native plant nurseries um, in sharing that knowledge that we have. We uh, last year uh, distributed about 23,000 seed packs to folks all up and down um, the East Coast, um, focused really on, on the Northeast and Northern New England. Um, and we are really passionate about finding avenues to get seeds into the hands of people who are excited, excited about that. So in addition to um, having seeds for sale, uh, as Anna mentioned, we're also working to distribute seeds to teachers, to um, our partners in indigenous communities, uh, to nonprofit organizations, um, and to, to, to libraries, and to really get um, people who maybe have been excluded from this conversation or um, simply not aware that the conversation has been happening around native plants, excited about this as a critical entry point uh, into this important climate resilience building work and habitat restoration work. Next slide. And so I think as Heather really aptly illustrated um, yesterday, um, we are really focused on the work that's not just for the experts. Um, I think in um, creating Wild Seed Project, Heather really had in mind that, you know, through her extensive work um, doing propagation and design and working in all levels of the industry, she saw that a lot of, there was a lot of gatekeeping um, and that was kind of keeping average people from being able to um, engage with seed work. Um, you know, propagation seeming so mysterious and only for the experts um, and all the other things that go with native plants, native plants and, and restoring biodiversity. And I think in order, I think we, we need to work on multiple levels and scales and the restoration efforts are extremely significant. Um, but I think the movement that we can create from people, home, homeowners and people doing this work in their communities, in neighborhood scale, as well as in public places um, and businesses, we can not only show what it can look like to add native plants back to our landscapes, but we can stay connected with them if we're doing it ourselves and getting plants into the ground in a way that is, is, is affordable and is um, something that doesn't seem intimidating. So the seed sowing process Heather went over yesterday um, and it really doesn't take a lot of skill. It just takes a little bit of education and reorientation. I think a lot of people, um, you know, are really used to vegetable gardening and um, gardening with tender perennials and flowers. Um, but it's it's something that is a, a very different kind of mindset shift to um, so to garden with native plants and to sow the seeds of native plants in the winter rather than doing your um, propagation in the spring. Um, and it's really fun to be able to engage. It, it, it empowers people to get um, growing and learn more about the plants, not just getting them um, at full size from the nursery, um, but being able to see all different stages of their life cycles. So um, I think more native plants can go back into the ground with higher genetic diversity if we're encouraging people to, you know, reduce their yards and replace them with native plants grown from seed that they sowed themselves. Next slide.
One of the the newest pieces that we're really working on is expanding our youth programming. Um, we we talk a lot as an organization about how you know, for me as a, a vegetable gardener who was raised with uh, ornamental flower gardens, I am needing to every day relearn uh, what it means to work with the landscape where I live, um, and we really see this opportunity of working with young people who haven't been ingrained in a more traditional uh, horticulture approach, in uh, traditional gardens, to start with a different definition of beauty uh, and to start with a different definition of what a garden is and how we engage with our landscapes that we live within. Uh, and so we're really focused on how can we develop programs uh, that, that reach those youngest learners and those newest gardeners uh, and starting them from the point where they can describe and explain why winter sowing is a, an amazing way to get native plants to be propagated and to, to grow native seedlings, um, why native plants over ornamental plants are contributing to the ecosystems um, and healthy habitats, uh, and just overall kind of using young folks and that energy to uh, build, you know, new young seed stewards uh, who will take the mantle of this movement as folks, you know, in Heather's generation and in our generation are starting to retire to move out of this field. Next slide. So with my work with demonstration landscapes, I think that we have like a triple fold approach that we can take our, um, I think that we can do these demonstration landscapes to share with people what it can look like to, to garden with beautiful native species that create habitat and increase our biodiversity, um, climate resilience, but we can also use it as an educational tool by bringing signage in and giving workshops around these other types of places. Like in this photo, this is Maine Beer Company, a planting that we did last year in their, in their beer garden. Um, and access very different audiences. Um, we also are at the cusp of establishing our new native seed nursery with our partners in Cape Elizabeth, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. And that is on a historic farm where we'll, we will be growing uh, founders plots, which I'd really like to move away from that term, um, the colonial term of founders plots and, and think more about it, maybe just calling them something like a seed plot. But in any case, I think we can, use um, some of our various larger hubs and smaller hubs to kind of create more of a decentralized living seed bank by having these demonstration landscapes also serve as seed collection sites. And, um, you know, when you're leaving seed up in an area that's an ornamental planting, that's also another educational opportunity to show people that the seed heads of those native plants are just as beautiful and important for wildlife. Um, as the flowers of those native plants. So this kind of decentralized system definitely is complex and takes a lot of record keeping. Um, and we're kind of at the beginning of that, but I think that's kind of our vision going forward. And I really like what um, Eve had talked about in thinking about these um, yesterday and thinking about these broad interconnected networks uh, with small and larger hubs. And I think that this is one place that we can do that and not just keep it to the professional world, but keep it for people also that um, would like to be able to take part in this and feel some autonomy over their sense of growing native plants and, and adding biodiversity into their landscapes, which is so joyful on so many levels. Next slide. Um, and and for for Wild Seed Project, the centering of Indigenous wisdom is a critical part to what we're doing uh, and where we're going. Um, and I want to I'm excited about this panel and this conversation today to touch on um, this as a central um, tenant for the way that we think about native plants at Wild Seed Project. Um, we really believe in centering Indigenous wisdom and in following the lead of Indigenous communities. Uh, so this is. Is, um, examples of different ash seeds, which for Wabanaki communities are uh, critical, traditional, um, and culturally valuable plants uh, that are used for basket making um, throughout important, uh, important cultural practices um, and uh, beautiful art and representation of 
of culture that have uh, many Wabanaki artists have been winning art shows at the Heard Museum and other places uh, using this important resource. Um, but as we know, ash trees are threatened by the emerald ash borer. And so Wild Seed Project uh, is participating in work with uh, the forestry department at the University of Maine um, that is led by uh, Penobscot professors um, who are working to build community efforts to restore and preserve uh, ash trees for basket quality um, production. And so we're excited to be a grower of seedlings and to use the space that we have, the skills that we have, and the, the, the team that we have to put those resources uh, at the use or at the discretion of this indigenous led team um, and following their lead as to what we do with those seeds. And that's just one example of kind of the, the direction that we're going in the ways that we're thinking about this work. It is um, something that it takes time to build these relationships uh, with indigenous communities. And I don't want to undersell that, that in previous work before coming to Wild Seed Project, I had spent years building relationships with leaders in many of the Wabanaki tribal communities um, and organizations that are indigenous led throughout our state and was able to bring those relationships to get a, a you know, a head start, I guess, in building those connections with our organization, and it still takes time um, and is, a, I think, a relearning for us as an organization at, you know, this is work that doesn't go at the speed of um, grant deadlines or uh, fundraising goals or even the, the annual schedule that we have around creating a budget and kind of envisioning things. This is something that needs to take its time, um, but also requires us to prioritize it uh, as a central piece of how we're thinking about uh, seed use uh, and our place within this work of the, the Native plant movement. And next slide, if we have one. No, so thank you so much. Um, and we'll hand it back over to Uli for the next, uh, for Nancy, the next week. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Anna, for that uh, wonderful introduction and the vision of what uh, Wild Seed Project and the directions that it's moving. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Nancy Powell as our next presenter um, to talk a little bit about her efforts. Um, so uh, the floor is yours, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Uli. And thank you for the invitation to be on this panel. Um, it is quite an honor to be on the panel with Native Plant Trust and Wild Seed Project and TNC. I feel like you guys are the experts on native plants, communities, and propagation, and everything I know I learned from you guys. <laughs> so hopefully I'm using it correctly. Uh, so I work for Fish and Wildlife Service at a National Wildlife Refuge in Northeast Massachusetts. We also do manage uh, some refuges in New Hampshire. So the project I'm going to be talking about is uh, actually located in Newington, New Hampshire, Great Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Um, I do want to mention that uh, Fish and Wildlife Service obviously has a huge interest in native sea restoration and um, has been active in funding some of these efforts in the past and continues to do that. We have uh, refuges all throughout uh, the United States, a um, couple dozen in the Northeast, as well as uh, ecological uh, services uh, staff that work um, outside of refuges. Um, so really excited to be part of this. Um, I'm actually going to put on one more hat, Uli, if you don't mind. So in addition to working on um, kind of these more uh, restoration, conservation restoration projects. I do recently also coordinate a community group in my town that's actually expanded to about six communities right now called West Newbury Wild and Native, which takes a lot of what, you know, the Wild Sea Project does and brings that network to people that want native plants in their backyard. Um, so both combating invasives in town as well as promoting natives through growing it in our own backyards as well as on town land. So we have uh, a few demonstration projects that's being planned in, on public land in town, probably a couple dozen on private land. 
as well as um, we were able to recently work with the new middle and high school and got them to change the landscaping plan to incorporate stray native species as well as um, remove a lot of species we thought might become invasives in the future. Um, the wonderful thing about like working with that group is it's a really nice compliment as Andrea and Anna alluded to, to the work that I do for my job in Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, you know, we can only do so much as a conservationist, especially as a conservationist with a, a federal agency. Um, there is so much demand and need for this information on private land. And, you know, that, that work needs to happen on private land in order to have uh, an impact. Um, so going back to my project at Great Bay National Wildlife Refuge, the, um, the native seed that we decided to use was part a, of a impoundment restoration project. So this was a large pool that was dammed up um, originally in the 1900s as drinking water for the city of Portsmouth. And it's been a open pond uh, for about a hundred years. And we had decided some years ago that we wanted to restore it to a riverine system, which it was previously. Um, so you're looking at the design, those uh, black lines across are um, what basically rock weirs that we built across. Um, and the reason why we did that is a lot of these impoundments tend to have contaminants. And this, this particular impoundment is located, the refuge use the military base. So you can kind of imagine what kind of contaminants might be on the refuge. So we know that these sites were extremely contaminated and we didn't want to uh, release contaminants down to the um, more downstream. So the great control structures keep the contaminant in place. And I had, you know, kind of in the beginning, I kind of knew that we had one chance to try to make things as favorable to native land communities as possible. Once invasives comes in, it's really, really difficult to combat them. Um, so we wanted to do everything we can. So early on, we decided to use native plants, but native plants that is local to the coastal New Hampshire area and try to use genotypes that was as close as we can get to our sites in coastal New Hampshire. Um, so Yuli, if you want to, next slide. Um, I have to say that I probably kind of made that decision without a lot of knowledge about the native seed collecting and use process. And had I known, we might not have done it. <laughs> so it was a good thing that I didn't know as much as I did. Uh, luckily, I had an incredible technician at the time, uh, Kaya Walker, who's in that picture collecting seeds in the front. Uh, who now works for Park Service, um, who kind of worked with the Native Plant Trust to, to investigate a lot of this. There is a lot to know uh, when you're trying to use local seeds. Um, and so we used three different sources of seeds for this project. Um, the Seeds of Success is a national program that had collected seeds. And we have found out that there were some collected from 2015 to 2017. So they were a little bit old. We did this project in 2020, 2021. So talking to the Native Plant Trust, um, we kind of learned that uh, a lot of the seeds, especially the wetland seeds, probably were not gonna be very viable and wouldn't have really good germination rates given how old they were. So we kind of, we went ahead and, and selected the seeds that were suitable for our region and our habitat, but we, use them as kind of a bonus. Um, we didn't assume that they were gonna give us a lot of germination. We also tried collecting a few seeds um, from our site. Um, we had drawn down the impoundment earlier and what was nice about that was that we saw a lot of native plants coming back. So even though the site has been underwater for a hundred years, um, it was amazing to see how much wetland plants came back when we drew the water down. So we went ahead and collected some of that seeds. Um, it wasn't a lot. We, we learned how difficult that process is, not just the, the collection, but the cleaning. And we had assistance from 
uh, Michael from uh, Native Plant Trust showing us like what seeds to collect and which ones weren't worth collecting. Um, and then the rest of the seeds we got from uh, Northeast wetland plants out of Amherst, um, New Hampshire. And we were able to use one of their existing mixes. Um, we went through all their mixes and made sure that the species was correct. I worked with the state botanists. And then we decided to go ahead and customize our upland mix because we didn't find one that kind of was suitable for us, but they worked with us and um, was able to make a custom mix for us. Um, the other important thing we did was we worked with the state to change the erosion control standards for this, for this project. And the reason for that is a lot of times when you do a restoration project, the reseeding plan, the goal of it is to get plant cover as quickly as possible within days to weeks. So a lot of times they are using non-native seeds that are like really aggressive. They are calling for breaking out like roots and any material in the soil and they're adding fertilizers and supplements. And we didn't want any of that. We wanted the soil to be left at is, we wanted minimum disturbance. Um, and we also worked with the state to get permission to say, you know, we'll get 75% cover within two years instead of 80% cover in three months or something like that, whatever the standard was. And they, they were really great to work with. They, they allow us to make that change, um, understanding that, you know, it was important to use native seeds. Um, next slide. The good news is we actually didn't need that change in um, the standards for recovery. So I'm just gonna show you some photos and then I can answer questions if anybody has. But on the top left um, is the site in April after it was done. So you can kind of see the exposed mudflats after, the channel, uh, after we breached the dike. Um, wherever you see kind of that brown, those are erosion control, they're coconut mats. So everything we use was uh, either coconut mats that is all natural and will biodegrade or I also asked for so much hay. We did not allow any straw, um, any hay on site because those are sources of um, invasive plants. Um, and the picture on the right is two months later, the plants that came back. And this area that you see in the middle, we did not use any seeds. So that is natural germination. Um, and then this was an area that, like I said, that was flooded for over hundred years. Um, in the forefront, where the erosion control is, we did seed and we planted some shrubs in there as well. Um, and if you go to the left, lower, lower left, so this is October, so six months after we did the restoration project, you can see we, have, we had almost 100% cover. I would say at 90% of the sites, there was a couple of areas that was a little bit more sparse, like 20 to 30 to 50% cover, but most of it came up and then the green that you see, those are cattails that is growing up. And I didn't even know there was cattails in the system. I didn't even see it like before the restoration project. So, um, and then this past year, we went back and took a photo and you can see how dense that area has become. So um, the response has been certainly exceeding my expectations. Um, and I was really encouraged to see that you know, this area was the, the native plants were able to respond so quickly. I think that's my last slide. So I will pass it to you, Lee and Mike. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nancy. So I just, uh, uh, so for our final presentation, we'll uh, turn it over to Mike, uh, Mike Whittemore. Thank you, Mike, uh, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Uli. It's great to be here and thank you so much for the invite. Um, so yes, I work for the Nature Conservancy. I've been here for about four years and uh, we do, we focus on a lot of ecological restoration here of sort of barren fire adapted habitats, uh, mostly sand plain grasslands, like these coastal grasslands that exist on sandy soils. That's primarily what we focus on, especially recently or uh, right now. Um, but also keep in mind, we also have, we hold conservation easements on landowners' lands who are also trying to promote pollinator gardens and native 
plant gardens and that kind of thing too. So we're constantly thinking about how to make it easier on them as well. But what I thought I'd focus on here is just a project we've been working on for over 20 years at what we call Bamford Preserve. And it's really uh, from, from the ground up, I mean, we, we protected the land. It was a very expensive piece of land at the time, over $60 million that was gonna be housing development. Um, and it was a hay field at one point. And so, you know, us being the Nature Conservancy guided by science, we um, hooked up with the Marine Biological Laboratory and Chris Neal who worked there at the time to run experiments on how to like convert uh, agricultural grassland back to sand plain grassland, this native grassland, and how to do it the right way, you know, with native local ecotype. Um, and so really what this slide shows is sort of our seed harvesting um, process and processing and storage over time. Um, and typically what we do is we harvest in early to mid October here on the island. I know it differs on the mainlands. Uh, from other sort of uh, good quality grasslands on some of our other conservation lands. And what we want to focus on first was, you know, this generalist species. What's the foundational species for sand plain grasslands? And here it's, it's little blue stem. So, so we went around and harvested as much little blue stem as we could. And it took about 10 or 15 years to actually cover a 60 acre uh, piece of land. That was our first phase. So this slide really shows that whole process for um, adding a little blue stem, which is the first phase. And what we do is we just store it over winter uh, using a mesh tarp, dehumidifiers. And um, typically over the past couple of years, we were really getting to up around 100 pounds you know, per yield per year, which is a lot of seed um, when you consider that's after processing. We'd actually send the seed uh, maybe late winter to earn seed and earn seed was to actually do the processing. So we needed the seed. It was very important to get the seed back. That was what we call clean. So the stems, the combs were taken out and they'd send us back basically just the seed. And during that process, we would actually have it tested for viability and germination so we can adjust the, the seeding rate. And it's not necessary, you know, when you're doing restoration to have this clean seed. But in our case, we were contracting with an expert on the island named Carlos Montoya, who has a machine that required us to, to feed the clean seed in there. So, you know, with the, the uh, viability and germination with this clean seed, we were able to adjust the, the, the rate. Um, and I know it differs depending on like what proportion of grasses to forbs you want on a grassland. But for us, it was, our sweet spot was around like 12 to 16 pounds per acre. Um, and so you can see the seed in the top right there. That was about a hundred or more pounds of clean seed. And then um, below is when Ernst bagged it up and Carlos's seed are right there. Slide. <clears throat> well, so I talked about this first phase. The first phase was really to, and it, it's, in my opinion, is the hardest phase. You're trying to outcompete this non-native cool season grasses. And mostly what we had on the site was sweet vernal grass. It's really prolific stuff. We also had some cheat grass or some smooth brome there, you know, fodder species, that kind of thing. It was a hay field too. Uh, and so like, how do we outcompete these grasses as soon as possible? Uh, these experiments that Marine Biological Laboratory ran tested all these different experiments we took the top three from that experiment and then kind of dumbed it down a little bit to find the best possible solutions to converting. And what we found was uh, the biggest thing for me was that we really just had to go in there and till at least two or three times, really get those roots broken up and then plant the seed in the spring or fall. But for us, spring was the best time to plant seed. Uh, and that's, that's really the first phase. Uh, so you can see in the top left, the difference between the left and the right part of that picture. On the left, we were still, we had not um, tilled the left part of that field at that point, this was a few years ago. Uh, and on the right, that was at least two or three years removed from when we planted little blue stem. So as you can see, it comes in and basically a mat. Um, and so that's the first phase, it's the grasses and out competing the non-native uh, cool season grasses. The second phase is what we just started about a year or two ago, and that is to add diversity. 
And there's really three ways we know to add diversity. It's um, the stuff that comes up in the seed bed. So in the top left photo, you can actually see common and uh, common milkweed and then also butterfly weed just coming up on its own. This is stuff that's in the seed bed, it's native. We don't have to do anything, it just comes up. And that's great. Uh, as much as that as we can get, the better, right? The second is to plant local seed. Um, for Little Blue Stem, we were doing 12 to 16 pounds per acre. But when I talk about diversity, we're really trying to harvest forbs, wildflowers, a diversity of wildflowers that are native, not only generalist species, but also stuff that's uncommon as well. And that requires us to go out and harvest on different um, time frames, you know, because flowers have different phenologies. Um, so we're just starting that process now, and I can you can see the bottom right slide. We just got this brand new shiny seed harvester, the seed stripper that Ned Grohl's made for us custom out in Nebraska. We're super excited to start using that soon. But more of what we've been focusing on to add diversity the past two years has been um, putting plugs in. And I think this is really important, you know, having a, a nursery that focuses on native wild type like Poly Hill Arboretum does on Martha's Vineyard. We contract with them, especially for like difficult to uh, propagate species and then also rare species. So two years ago, we did butterfly weed. We did a thousand plants, plugs of butterfly weed here. And then we uh, did a thousand plugs of New England blazing star this year. It's considered a rare species here. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of keep it at that, but just want to give you a little bit of a picture of um, one of the main projects we do on the islands here, but also to think about, you know, how can we also make this seed available for folks like that we hold a conservation easement with who are landowners, uh, private landowners. All that to say, I'm really excited to, to hear what everybody else has to say. And what we're interested in here at uh, the Nature Conservancy is really uh, personally is, is, you know, Little Blue Stem especially, it's just like, can we use Little Blue Stem from other areas, you know, throughout what we call the seed transfer zone? And that's going to require garden plots, but also just talking more about what everybody's interested in here is like, how can we maximize, how can we scale up on some of these seeds so everybody else can use them? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, just gonna stop my share here and um, get ourselves rolling here with some questions. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I think what's what what I find particularly um, exciting about this conversation too, in in, in the sense that uh, a lot of the um, literature and so forth around seed increase um, is is um, really focused on restoration projects, which I think are are incredibly important, particularly as we grapple with. Um, sites that have uh, um, a history of pollution and degradation, uh, and certainly sites that have a, a uh, agricultural history um, that has introduced a lot of non-native grasses and other things into our region. Um, but more so, and you know, and I'm speaking a little bit biased here, that that there's also this great interest in on a much smaller scale uh, in in the use of native plants. Um, and so uh, I'm sort of interested in, in hearing, um, you know, how, how do you feel um, the, like, where's the overlap between these two sort of communities and how can we support each other in, in moving forward and making sure that there's enough of this uh, critical resource available for all of the different kinds of uses? And this is really kind of a question for, for anybody really to throw in there. Um, um, so please take it away. I think one thing we kind of need to take a step back and look at in this type of conversation is also just looking at the landscape level um, and how we can create connectivity um, throughout our fragmented landscape. So I think that's where I, I see, especially with our developed landscapes, um, you know, individuals coming into this. Um, I think it, it, it's really easy to underestimate um, the power of, you know, replacing lawns and 
um, all those yard spaces and public spaces that could be habitat. And um, in these really important corridors, I think a lot of the corridors are created by highways and um, power line cuts, and they go through developed areas. And those are corridors right now for a lot of invasive species. And I think we have a lot of, um, a lot more, um, ability than we realize if we're engaging citizens to do this work as well and not just keep it for the professionals. So I appreciate that restoration scale and level, but I um, also think that this work can't kind of exist just in that vacuum. And unfortunately, I have felt like a lot of the conversation um, has centered around that. I think that's great. We need to kind of think um, on that really nuanced level about ecoregion. Um, but I also think that we're losing consumers who don't even really understand the value of a native plant in the first place. So um, there's, there's these different kind of like impacts that we can make in our um, cultural levels as well that we need to consider. And I think it has to be part of the conversation if we wanna make it um, a movement. And I'll just add that um, even with every one of us who are doing this work as our, you know, day job, um, doing this work to the greatest extent that we can, we will not be able to produce enough seed to cover the landscapes that we need to see transformed with native plants. And so working with individuals, training them, teaching them how to do this work and showing them that it is accessible and it is something that they can do so that they then build up their own seed banks at their own homes or places of work or places where they play or frequent and then share that seed and, and pulling, you know, pulling some of that out of the, the sale context and being able to share um, and building up that overall network, that is really how we get to the, the massive scale that we need to be at in order to, to face the changing climate, in order to make sure that we have healthy ecosystems and, and lush habitat throughout that is connected um, point to point. Yeah, yeah I, I, will, I will kind of second that. Um, I think, you know, as important as the work on conservation land is there is so much potential to do greater good much more quickly when you engage the community and and luckily there is so much interest and passion for native lands and wild lands and kind of you know introducing native so we um you know, just an example our, our very small group of a dozen to two dozen people um a bunch of us had ordered wild seed uh, seeds from the Wild Seed Project uh, one or two years ago. And, you know, the ones that were successful, we now have this abundance of seeds that we're sharing. You know, the local, a lot of the communities have garden clubs that do plant sales and our local uh, garden club has decided to offer a native section in partnership with us. And like when the when this plant cell opens, there is a mad dash for the native plants. It is probably the most in demand. Um, and the nice thing is like with the plants and with the seeds comes with that local knowledge of what does well in your garden, you know? And, and I think there is another step which we're beginning to do the work and there's a lot of people that's out there doing it is how do you take something that is, you know, much bigger in a wild landscape area, which ones are suitable for for gardens, you know, because gardens often require like a little bit more neat and a little bit smaller, but we do have plants that can fit that role. It's figuring out what those native plants are and then making it a little bit more available through this network that we have. Um, it's, we have some great local growers, but a lot of it is just gardeners trying things and then sharing with each other. Yeah, I have a sort of a follow-up question to this about specific, I think that there's, maybe the question should be are, you know, the plants that uh, home gardeners seek out, are they the same things that should go into restoration um, projects? And, uh, and, and oftentimes the, the things that we think of as being like 
backbone species in ecosystems may not be things that people consider um, ornamental or aesthetic uh, necessarily. And so how do you rectify that, that sort of the gap in between the need for us to really be able to produce a, a wide diversity of seeds for all these different uses, yet still meeting, um, you know, the 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 home gardener, um, as well as meeting the demand for uh, um, for the restoration practitioner. Um, you know, Michael, you mentioned using uh, and growing a regionally rare endemic plant. Um, is that something that um, should really just stay with restoration ecologists or, and this is, you know, controversial topic here, but should home gardeners also have access to that material or not? I mean, these are, you know, I think this is a good forum to talk about some of that. That, that I can't answer. I, that is controversial. And, um, but I, I know we, it's good to use it for our purposes and restoration. But that's a good question. Like, uh, you know, and we're, I'm looking at this in two different levels, right? It's like this generalist seed for grasslands to maximize, right? So that, that needs a lot of land to grow on. But also it's a very important component that everybody can use are these local native nurseries, which I am all for. And those, the nurseries are the folks who, you know, Polyhill Arboretum is the one who grows these difficult species to grow and also the rare species, which we, go through the permitting process to actually plant those on our conservation lands. Yeah, I wondered if, if I, either Andrea or Anna had a, a perspective on, on you know, what, what, what do consumers ask for? What sells well uh, versus, um, you know, what is available? Yeah, I think we have some really, really tough questions. Um, or that's a very tough question because mm -hmm. it brings up a whole host of other questions. Um, but yeah, I think places like Garden in the Woods and other botanical gardens can be um, some of those places to experiment with um, different species that haven't traditionally been used in ornamental horticulture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really a fun and like interesting place to go with native plants um, so that maybe eventually they can, the demand would grow for them and they could become more commercially available in retail. Um, and there's also a question about, you know, species like blue lobelia, which is rare in a number of New England states and is widely sold in places like Home Depot and other <laughs> nurseries um, already. And, you know, I know that th that's a question that Native Plant Trust has struggled with, um, with, you know, do we sell that plant because it's already going out into the landscape on large scales um, in people's homes, but it is a rare species. So, the, the local populations are probably not there. The, the natural populations are not where people are planting them, around where people are planting them. And um, would we rather have at least uh, some seed grown material getting out there, um, uh, you know, to contribute to that if, if we are seeing it already being sold in other nurseries. But that is, it's just a, I think that we're gonna come to a lot of those different um, kind of impasses that we need to just keep that conversation going. What is appropriate for the home landscape? Um, I, I agree that um, a species like New England blazing star is, is not, I think that's an easy one. Um, it, there's such small populations of it in New England. And um, I don't think that that's appropriate for planting. And it's also not necessarily the greatest landscape plant for ornamental horticulture. Um, it's not always easy in a typical, you know, homeowner's garden. It needs those, that well-drained sandy soil and that fire adapted habitat. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we could have a whole conversation just about what should we, what should we sell in nurseries? Yeah. Well, I mean, but I, I, I bring it up because I feel like the, the seed collection process and how that goes into these increased programs is also in some degree a response to the demand that's out there. Mm -hmm. and, and how to balance the, the availability of, of, you know, let's say um, for a wetland restoration, three different species of juncus that are important, but not something that somebody uh, as a homeowner would want to buy versus, um, you know, because we, we want, in the end, you want the restorations to be successful. You also want the 
uh, the plantings, the demonstration gardens and the plantings to be successful, because if they're not, then that is, then it just, it kind of turns people off on the whole idea. Um, and so, you know, the what plants to grow and what to sell, I think is an important part of the conversation. I, um, sorry, I, yeah, I, I really feel like we are at a turning point in terms of, you know, going back to this definition of what is beautiful or what goes into a garden. It's actually one of, um, one of the things I'm most excited about for for Anna's work moving forward is this, um, you know, offering people images of gardens that either mirror and complement their own views of what a traditional ornamental garden should look like, but with native plants, all the way to gardens that are pushing us to think differently um, about all different types of form and design and placement. Um, it, if we can start with education for folks around what is in a garden and what is a garden for, that opens up a whole avenue for us to, to think differently about what plants people are gonna be excited about planting. Um, I, I do think that one of the side, one of the side effects, I guess, cultural side effects of the pandemic um, has been people slowing down and actually experiencing the built landscapes around them differently. Um, and so I think the, the ma massive increase in demand for native seeds and native plants, certainly that we've seen, I mean, we've, we've doubled in demand almost every year uh, during the pandemic or more so, um, that that is connected to people interacting with those garden spaces differently. They are spending more time not just walking by, so the visual isn't the only piece of what's coming from those gardens. Uh, it is the activity and the energy and the life that's happening in those spaces that people are starting to see. And I think that it is imperative for those of us in uh, in positions where we are doing public education and public communication to, to, to grab onto that and to continue to support that messaging of there are different different ways to see the beauty in a garden or in a landscape um, that we, we just want to cultivate more of that because I think that spells so much more success for people to integrate native plants into the landscapes where they live. Yeah, I think as yeah. is 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 an interesting follow-up question to this too. Uh, I'm sorry, Nancy, did you have a comment you wanted to? Well, or? I was going to say yeah. that, you know, in, in terms of growing seeds, I don't know that there needs to be, like, we need to pick between restoration and small gardens, because I think they're almost different mm -hmm. um, nurseries. Um, and I, I think it's important for those of us in the restoration field to have a conversation about what seed is, where, where the, the seeding is even necessary. You know, as Michael alluded to, sometimes the seed bank is there and we're seeing that more and more, like the seed bank is there. If the seed bank is there, we're actually doing more damage when we try to seed it and then all the things that comes with seeding it. Um, so I think we need to like design our restoration project a little bit differently and maybe work with nurseries to grow our seeds, like plan a little bit in advance because we need it in such a big scale that the smaller nurseries can meet our needs anyways. Um, and then I think in terms of like, you know, there's a lot of chat about, you know, kind of rare and endangered plants at, at, you know, in gardens. And I think the only thing that people should really consider besides your state regulations, which they are some, um, is that, you know, you need to think about genetics and hybridization. Like I know in New Hampshire, it's illegal to plant the wild lupin uh, because it is in danger. And the, the concern is that it will hybridize with the non-native lupin and then you mess up the, the wild population. So I think we got to think about, you know, the whatever you plant in your garden can hybridize with whatever is wild out there and making sure that you are not changing the genetic uh, range that's in your local area. So just having that conversation or beginning to have that conversation will be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, Anna alluded to this a little bit. I think the context of like where you live and what you plant, uh, uh, in, you know, if you live in, in the center of Portland, um, you know, the, the likelihood of your 
seed or the genetic material distributing out and affecting a, a natural areas may be less than if you live adjacent to conservation land or to a national park or something like that. And I think that people have to have the awareness to, to understand that their choices are more important in, in those two uh, kinds of contexts. Um, I wanted just because we're, we're running a little bit out of time, but I wanted to, to uh, ask uh, about um, sort of follow up maintenance to these kinds of plantings and there's and, and how important that is in terms of, uh, of the of not just the success of the program, but also of the perception on the public side mm -hmm. of of how successful it is and whether and I know there's there, there again there's different challenges on larger scale uh, uh, um, projects like uh, what you're dealing with, Michael or Nancy, but also I think even down to the homeowner scale or demonstration scale that um, there needs to be some degree of follow up to show that these are successful and manageable and that it, it wasn't, you know, that it was worth all the effort to do this. Um, okay. And I feel like a lot of projects fail because they don't plan into uh, a sufficiently enough time for um, for follow up maintenance or other sorts of interventions down the road. So um, I, I'd love to start with the larger scale. Uh, maybe yeah. direct this question to uh, Michael and Nancy, and then we'll um, finish it up uh, with a Andrew and Anna. I can start out. I can I give you a couple of examples. This is important for us. Um, First of all, the Nature Conservancy does a lot of long-term monitoring on our plots, um, whether we restore them or not. Like we do rare species monitoring, for example, on our plants. And we also do long-term monitoring on areas that we manage, like with fire, for example. And if we change the fire regime, we want to see how that changes the vegetation as well and, and so forth. So that's one sort of component. Uh, but just to give you a couple anecdotes of uh, what we do, is we planted these 1,000 New England blazing stars this past year. We know there's a lot of deer out there and deer love this stuff. It's like candy to them. There's also meadow voles, there's rabbits out there and all the rest. And we noticed right away, I would go out there every couple of days and I was worried about the drought, right? Because the, the biggest concern for me is, is being able to water these plants enough, right? This is in like sand plain desert. Uh, it's a drought year, um, but what we found is that New England blazing star has such a, an advantage, right? Like an evolutionary advantage, they're drought tolerant. So that wasn't really the issue. It was more so the, the herbivory. So I noticed such a big impact within a week that me and my assistant, Rich, came up on the fly with just putting up like this deer exclosure. We did it in two different areas and we noticed a really big difference. And so we are an organization guided by science, but we only have so much capacity to, to design a, a project for every single thing we do. But this is just a case where we sort of adaptively manage and, and come up with a solution on the fly. And I think just even having those two populations with um, some success outside of those deer exclosures is gonna go a long way. Like year after year, they're gonna disperse more seeds and that kind of thing. And then one other example is that we're developing a, a large sort of a large savanna. We're, we're building in like this mosaic of habitats of savanna and scrubland and grasslands. That's gonna happen this spring. And we're already thinking about investing a lot of the money we have available to not only tree care, but like deer, repel like there's going to be sort of a crew of people who are going to be watching you know how things react and, and getting on issues uh, when they come up so it's not completely foolproof we're going to have some some issues but hopefully it'll increase success Nancy um yeah so for us similar to Michael we rely a lot on monitoring and so this project that we did, it's actually a small site restoration project for me. Most of my time is doing salt marsh restoration that probably takes up 80% of my time. You know, So this is a tiny portion of my, me and my staff's time that is devoted to this project. Um, so we cannot do that much monitoring, uh, but you know, I think in the planning, and this is maybe something that maybe needs a little bit more research. I know that is coming up next, but understanding kind of that succession of native uh, restoration, right? Like what are the species that come up first? So like for my site, like there was species that came up, uh, cut grass, barnyard grass, smallweed, 
very, very quickly. Um, and I think that was important, um, both in the C-Bank and in our C-Mix, because you needed something that would outcompete invasives that would come in, you know, initially. But over time, we're kind of hoping that the rest of that C-Mix and that native C-Bank will transition to a more diverse wetland community. And that's what we're going to be monitoring for. We did do a little bit of shrub planting, um, but we also know that, you know, between herbivory and competition, a lot of those plantings tend not to do well in these type of restoration projects. We don't water. <laughs> we just kind of like, so we plant in areas that are wet, naturally wet, um, because we can't go out there and water the plants after we plant them. Uh, or we plan in the fall, or we kind of time our planning so that it, it you know, right before a, rain, in, uh, a rainy week. Um, and, um, you know, and we use resources like I know that the Wild Sea Project has a list of plants that will like compete well with invasives, native plants. So like we use things like that and, and we take advantage of more native aggressive species that we don't mind having in our project sites. Um, but monitoring is a big component of it. Thank you. Andrea, Anna, can you bring us home? Sure, I think um, I'll, there are definitely a lot of, um, of the same things that we can use in restoration um, projects that, you know, same rules that we can often use in those smaller scale plantings. And a lot of time I draw inspiration from those restoration projects. Um, I like the idea of, of using some of those workhorse plants, especially um, like partridge pea and black eyed coneflower that are um, shorter lived that can help establish a planting in the first couple of years. And that establishment can be um, one of the hardest parts. And I think so working with partners on demonstration projects, um, it's a lot of like the design that goes into it, as well as the relationships you build with the partners and the education to for with the partners as that's ongoing, it doesn't end at the installation. Um, and then in turn, those partners are educating the public. Um, so I think that it's definitely challenging depending on the site and the type of partner that we have. I, I think we're still at the beginning of a lot of this, but you know, whether it's a, a company that has a landscape crew um, or whether we can, you know, recommend our, uh, you know, a trusted landscape um, or fine gardener crew that can come in and do more, more of that fine weeding. Um, but definitely walking them through through establishment at least and then beyond what to do with when you cut things back um providing in the design also things like cues to care um you know main, making sure that the heights are something of the plants are part of those cues to care you know not having really tall plants in a small space just a lot of the same of the design um, principles that you would use in another ornamental garden would be just as important in a place like that. And I think starting with a good design is really important than shepherding them through that management, um, that establishment and management is significant. I think we probably will keep working with a lot of these partners for a long time. And that's part of that relationship building too. So they come to trust that we have good guidance to give them and that they uh, start to understand more why we're giving them the guidance that we might give, you know, not cutting New England aster back right away um, because it leaves some stems for the bees that will nest in them um, and helping people recognize maybe through signage that this plant is left up and that's not normally what you would do in an ornamental landscape, but it's still beautiful in its own right when it has its seed heads and has its um, functionality continuing to work through the, the whole growing season and into the winter. And uh, I'll just wrap up with this maintenance question is the beauty of working with home gardeners um, because we love to tinker with our garden and to, to be out there as a gardener is part of the experience is consistently maintaining and moving things around and adding new things. And so it is less a chore 
for the home gardener than it is necessarily potentially for the a restoration frame. And so if we're able to expand who is using these plants, who's using the seed and growing those on, I know the seedlings that I've grown from seed are ones that I care so deeply about that I am out there on a regular basis, making sure that they are thriving and, and seeing any types of threats to them. And so, you know, the more that we can get the general public involved and engaged and hands-on with this work, the more successful we'll be able to be overall. Um, and we can all, you know, many hands make light work. If we can all be doing this together, that's going to greatly increase the availability of seed. It's going to greatly increase the uh, seedlings and the, the amount of acres and the amount of plants that go in the ground. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andrew, for a wonderful summary of that. I think, you know, the the, the building of the communities that, you know, as, as a gardener, learning learning and, and applying what, you, what you've what you learned into the future, I think is really central to both restoration and, and home gardening efforts, uh, just as much as, as, you know, the consistent uh, message that is, you know, welcoming and positive and that we're, we're really trying to make a difference here, I think is really important. So um, thank you, Nancy, Andrea, Anna, and Michael for your perspectives today. Um, everybody, let's give them a nice warm uh, virtual applause. Uh, and I'm going to turn the uh, um, platform over to my colleague, Michael, who's going to introduce our final panel for the afternoon. Um, and take it away, Michael. Great, thanks, Oli. And thank you, everybody. That was a fantastic talk as uh, we've had a series of today. So um, the last panel we'll be focused on is is looking at seed research and, uh, and networking to that regard. Um, the reason both of these topics are kind of stuck in one uh, bucket at the end is that ultimately, I think with a lot of the practical implications of uh, of having seed and, and using it, as we talked about from the home gardener to the habitat restoration scale, uh, there's a need to network either with researchers or to leverage the ability to do research on some of these uh, practical seed increase uh, areas. Um, as we've seen, I think a lot during this, uh, this symposium, questions come up about uh, genetics and about ecotypes and about climate change and how all of these different things are taken into account to actually inform best practices for seed increase and, uh, and its use. Um, so fortunately today we have a great uh, panel of people that have experience with, with this, uh, either on seed research or in uh, how networks can function to answer some of these questions. Um, so we'll start by just introductions from all of them, as we have with other panels, uh, and Uli uh, can get that queued up for us now. Okay, and we're going to go alphabetically. So first on the list, um, I should introduce everyone just briefly. Uh, first is research botanist Jessamine Finch, Dr. Jessamine Finch, uh, who has been uh, with Native Plant Trust and teaching a lot of us about uh, seed genetics and ecology over the past couple of years. Um, so wonderful to have uh, her here. We also have Dr. Kerry Havens uh, from Chicago Botanic Garden, uh, as well as Katie Cusera, who's also a Chicago Botanic Garden, uh, both in different capacities. Um, and Ed Toth, who many of you know and probably doesn't need much introduction uh, Ed is uh, and has been the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank, uh, has established a lot of the understanding we have uh, at Native Plant Trust in, in some of the seed distribution pathways and seed use. Uh, and we were a partner during um, the Seeds of Success program, uh, both with Chicago Botanic Garden as well as with Mars B. Um, so with that, we'll start with Jessa and uh, take it away. Yes, I'm incredibly humbled to go first, just as a virtue of my last name. Um, there are folks in this panel who have, yeah, lots more experience than I bring to the table, but I'm excited to talk about seed research and how it relates to what we've been talking about the past two days. And I'll try to keep it, keep it brief. Um, you can go ahead and advance. So currently in my position at Native Plant Trust, uh, my work kind of breaks out into these three buckets. I spend the most of my, most of my time uh, focused on the germination of rare native plants through my work with our seed bank for the New England Plant Conservation Program. For a lot of our rare plants, we have very limited information about the germination and dormancy um, traits uh, that they have, and uh, we're learning lots while we are trying to track the viability of our collections. Uh, a couple of years ago, I also got involved with some researchers who are interested in the effects of smoke on germination of abundant native taxa. Um, this work was led by Professor George Lacasio, uh, who at the time was at Framingham State University. He's now at Matt Wachusett Community College. And I've mostly been working there on applying um, 
or testing rather, seeds response to smoke water agar in a lab setting, but we're also working with um, Alexis Docious at our uh, nursery to look at this in um, raised beds, so in a propagation setting, and are hoping to design some work to look at this in um, a field setting with prescribed burn-ins. And then I'm very excited to start, have recently started collecting samples from um, Eco, the Ecotype project in Eco59 so that we can have some baseline genetic information about the plant material that's going into their seed increase in seed farming efforts. And we can go to the next slide and I'll briefly talk about uh, kind of what led up to my work here. Um, before coming to Native Plant Trust, I primarily uh, was working on abundant restoration relevant taxa. My dissertation focused on milkweed specifically. Um, and to very quickly summarize parts of my dissertation in a single slide, um, Kay's grinning because she was the chair of my, dis of my dissertation committee. Um, uh, we, we found that for a, um, in this case, a widely distributed generalist like common milkweed, we had very, very little genetic structure. So very little differentiation between populations collected from a gradient throughout the, uh, the Midwest. Um, and even in this structure plot, you can see no differentiation discernible between wild collected material and commercially available seed material. Um, next, you can see that uh, when we looked at how this connected to uh, performance in the field in terms of recruitment um, or establishment from seed, on the bottom uh, row, we have uh, the common milkweed. And on the top row, we have a congener swamp milkweed, which is more of a specialist in its habitat. We found that common milkweed had basically no sensitivity to seed source in terms of the life stages I looked at. Um, regardless of what latitude I sourced material from, they all germinated, emerged, survived, and accumulated the same amount of biomass, which was not true for swamp milkweed, more of a specialist. Um, and uh, while there was low sensitivity at these early life stages, you can advance. Um, it's important to note that we do see for, swamp, for common milkweed um, phenotypic variation at later life stages. So this work is not yet published, but we did see um, significant variation in flowering phenology, as you can see here, where northern seed sources were flowering earlier, had greater synchrony in their flowering, so more individuals were flowering at the same time, and were flowering over a shorter period of time as compared to more southern source material, which was fl flowering um, in a less synchronous manner over a longer period later in the season. And so while I wanted to be able to make um, some blanket claims about some of these more uh, widespread taxa with greater, level gene, greater levels of gene flow being less sensitive to seed sourcing, uh, while I can say that it's true at the recruitment stage in terms of establishing, uh, there is potentially significant variation at later life stages. And then we can advance to the next slide. And I'll just um, end by saying that I was recently a part of a publication that was looking at um, seed sourcing literature globally. Um, so looking at studies that have exa examined variation in um, variation in traits among different populations of the same species. And most of this literature to date has been conducted or has been published on woody plants. Most of it's come out of North America and Europe. Um, but we have been seeing an increase in graminoids and forbs, which we've been talking about a lot these past two days, beginning in the late knots. Um, and kind of as I think we assume a legacy effect or a, um, related to the fact that this is mostly been on a one day taxa, a lot of the traits that have been looked at are not reproductive. So a lot of a lot of the things we've been considering have been things like plant height and biomass accumulation, which are much more relevant for the timber production um, side of things than for a lot of us folks in ecological restoration who are more interested in reproductive traits and phenology. So that's a whirlwind tour of where I've been and where I'm going. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessa. Hey, Havens. All right, thank you. And uh, so lovely to see you, Jessa. <laughs> um, so you can go to the next slide. I, I'm from Chicago Botanic Garden and I work on a, a lot of different things from ex situ conservation to engagement and policy. Um, but today I'm going to focus on um, research related to improving restoration, and I specifically left out of my intro any of Jess's work, knowing that she was going to be here today. Um, next slide. And when I think about improving restoration, even that, there's a lot of different types of studies we do in that area, um, from working on the native seed supply, overcoming bottlenecks during restoration, uh, today, the slides I'm going to share really look at um, genetic change or genetic loss during the production process. Next. 
So this is um, a lot, and um, you'll see this on my next two slides too, um, apologies. Uh, but this is some wonderful work done by Adrian Vasey Sinclair and colleagues at the garden um, about seven or eight years ago, where they looked at native plant um, material production and what could happen at each step of the process. So those of us who do this know that we're imposing selection at every step of the way from when we collect seeds, which plants we choose um, to collect seeds from when we clean them, um, you know, the size of the sieve we're using, how we store them. And then from there, we can either directly sow seeds back into the wild, we can produce live material, or we can put that material into a cultivated field for a repeated harvest. Um, and each of those has its own um, selection events going on with the pr production of cultivated seed, um, having the most opportunity for genetic change. Next. So on this slide, um, this is recent work. Um, it's in review right now. It's not even published um, from two postdocs, Zoe Diaz-Martin and Marcello Davitis. And they're interested in uh, the effect of stratification length on the genetic diversity that we retain um, in a, you know, when we're producing material for restoration. And they worked in three violet species. And the figures on the right show, um, uh, the cartoon is kind of a hypothetical of um, as we move from short to long stratification, which individuals um, are, are making it through that selective sieve. And uh, the bottom panel there shows if you only stratify for a short amount of time, you're potentially losing a lot of genetic diversity. And we thought, well, you know, um, potentially, but let's see if it's actually true. And so um, the panels on the right of this slide, um, as we go down, there are three different violet species. Um, each column, uh, the first one is all SNPs, or the markers we were using. The second column is express SNPs, so those that have some sort of biological function. And the graph shows gene diversity. And so you can see at each SNP, there's a lot more diversity in the long stratified plants than in those that only receive the short stratification. And what's even more disturbing is um, for expressed SNPs, those biologically active um, areas, we're seeing a big decrease in genetic diversity too. So this is a selective sweep that's happened in a single generation by having a short stratification period. Um, watch for that soon, we hope, we hope to see it out soon. And the last slide, the next slide, is work from um, another former graduate student, uh, Bing Lee, who, um, who worked on this plant, Enothera organensis. Um, it's a rare plant um, from the Oregon Mountains in New Mexico. We took advantage of the fact that it has been in cultivation in the greenhouse uh, at Indiana University for about 80 years. So this is example of changes that happen over a very long um, period of time in ex situ cultivation. And we grew up seeds from the Indiana University greenhouse and from plants collected in the wild, um, grew them in a common garden. And what Bing found was, uh, I see the questions popping up. I'll answer that in just a second, Linda. Um, what Bing found were significant differences between um, the plants that come from these two sources. So plants from Indiana that had undergone, we estimate five or six generations, um, uh, they were bigger, um, they had a longer floral tube, they had a longer style, significantly so, but they produced less nectar. And this is a hawk moth pollinated flower. And so the hawk moth needs to reach the nectar in the bottom of that floral tube. And if the tube is longer and the nectar is shorter, this plant isn't gonna be pollinated if we reintroduce it to the wild, not pollinated successfully, I should say. And um, you know, these, these changes are not something you might notice um, just looking at them but they are enough to affect um, pollination success in the wild. And this is a plant that can't set seed on its own. It needs um, the, the pollinator visit. So 
a couple of examples there. And I saw a question um, again, uh, came up on the last slide about short and long stratification. Uh, the short period was uh, four weeks, the long period was 12 weeks of cold moist stratification. That's it. Thank you, Kay. That was excellent. Katie Kusera. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katie Kusera. I'm currently the research assistant for the Plants of Concern program at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Um, and for those who are not familiar with Plants of Concern, it is um, a long-term rare plant monitoring program that is um, also a community science project. Uh, we have hundreds of volunteers that monitor um, rare, threatened, and endangered species every year. And I've been with Plants of Concern for about a year and a half. Um, I joined this panel a bit last minute by Jess's invitation, so I'm excited to be part of this conversation, but unfortunately I didn't um, include any um, figures or helpful information about my seed research background. Um, but anyway, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, for my master's thesis research, I um, did this project on a species that um, is of restoration importance in the Western US and the Great Basin. Um, and I looked at the genetics of um, the wild populations of the species and also looked at its um, germination requirements for the wild populations. Um, so even though I didn't include any um, direct figures from this research, we did find that um, wild populations that were had um, genetic distinctiveness and were grown for restoration in seed increase rows um, as long as those wild populations were sort of kept separately by the time they were seeded into restorations, um, that genetic diversity was maintained and ultimately the restoration site was the filter for which um, genetic print was like most suitable for um, that site. So I have background in um, doing that sort of seed research in combination with population genetic diversity. Um, and currently with Plants of Concern, although we're not um, super seed research focused now, we are starting to look into more regional priority species and how to utilize seeds to help those species that are of greater concern that might not be doing very well in their wild populations. Um, next slide. And I think I also bring some perspective um, from Illinois in the Midwest, um, where I'm located in Northeastern Illinois, there is a lot of um, volunteer ecological restoration interest. And I've worked with a lot of volunteers who do a lot of seed collecting and seed mix design for restorations that are being performed at various sites and various habitats across Northeast Illinois. Um, so I do a lot of work with different species doing that sort of work as well. Um, and I think that's it for me. Thank you, Kate. Mr. Ed Toth. Hi. Um, well, first of all, uh, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> so I'm a little baffled why I'm why I'm on this committee, but or this uh, presentation. But uh, I will try and uh, bring some things in that make some sense to, that that I think are relevant to this topic of from a non-scientific standpoint, a great deal of my involvement, especially lately, um, has been on the national level and dealing with uh, national policies. Um, are my slides around somewhere? Uh, I think Willie's trying to grab those now. Okay. Um, you know, I was able to listen to the last 20 minutes of the last session. And uh, one thing that very much struck me was that, um, and, and this has been reiterated through, uh, through this whole symposium, I think, is that, you know, the supply chain is extremely multifaceted. Um, and I think what research points to is that um, at the other end of, of uh, the spectrum on all this is we do, we do need the involvement um, of uh, higher institutions, um, academics and the like, research both applied and um, practical is extremely necessary to rolling out the supply chain in a meaningful way. 
um, everything from seed banking. Uh, well, actually, let's start with seed collection. Um, you know, uh, it's clear that a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of groups that I heard speaking in the last session, I think this is probably universally true that, uh, you know, a lot of groups are going out and making their own collections. Um, and that's a practical reality. Um, the survey that, that my group Marsby did of users uh, uh, four years ago in the East really pointed out that a lot of people were doing their own collecting. So it, it just drives home the importance of um, either good ed education of all those folks or, or for some uh, other authority trying to uh, meet the need of of, uh, of seed that everyone needs because sampling is so important. Um, and I, and I, I am just aware of a lot, of, a lot of groups and a lot of nurseries that are not sampling uh, to begin with in an appropriate way to capture maximum uh, genetic diversity. I'm certainly worried about over exploitation of the resources. I've been talking for a decade about in my view that, you know, I view wild seed as a critical natural resource. And um, it worries me that as the more and more uh, groups get involved and, and are, are realizing that they have to do this on their own, um, that we're kind of entering, uh, you know, perhaps a wild, wild west uh, stage of things where um, there's real no refereeing of, of where seed is being taken from, whether seed is being overexploited or not. Um, and so I, I think uh, I certainly personally, you know, I run a regional seed bank, Native Plant Trust does as well. I think there's a really critical role um, for seed banks in, in uh, trying to regulate all that. Uh, but of course, if, if we are going to seek to take on that role, then we also have the, the obligation to see that, that uh, all the seed, all of you need, all the wild seed is, is available. So, um, you know, that's the part of the supply chain that, that I'm most familiar with and working uh, towards. Uh, yeah, the other thing I would just say, sorry. I have, to, I have to ask you because you say you're not a scientist, but I know you've done a lot of research into the supply chain of seed, native seed, and uh, the demand for it. And that's that's in part why I think you have a lot to speak about uh, with this regard in, in this regard. Right. Okay. Well, let me touch on on that for a minute. I think uh, what I you know, you know I am along with Kay. I'm on this committee of the National Academy of Sciences. We've been at this for three years. Um, it is a nationwide investigation into the state of the supply chain, um, and it's been a real eye opener for me. I'm sure it has for Kay as well. Um, and it is focused on the West, but it is not exclusively so. Um, but I think one of the things I've really delved into in, in working on this committee is that, uh, you know, there is a historic context to the involvement of the federal agency in all of this uh, that goes back really to 2001, at least. Um, and Congress actually mandated the federal agencies, particularly the Department of Interior and USDA DA, to, to see, they, they were really primarily worried about fire, uh, materials for fire, post-fire uh, stabilization. Uh, and, and even then, and it hasn't gotten all that much better, the, the availability of what they needed was uh, was not there. So there's been a mandate to the federal agencies for 20 years um, to see that there's an adequate seed supply uh, to meet federal needs. And uh, there's been some movement on that, but the reality is that if you look today at the situation, that goal has not been met um, there. And so, you know, I think that's a lot of why uh, individuals have gone their own way and have gone and tried uh, to work this all out on their own. And I think that's commendable and an, and an important part of the supply chain. Um, but I think a lot of people uh, have kind of, <laughs> if they ever had any hope uh, for the federal government and federal dollars to, to really elevate the game on meeting, I, I really think 
you know, if we're really going to deal with climate change and the collapse of biodiversity, we need to be talking about uh, monies and efforts being spent on plant material that's just orders of magnitude beyond uh, what we're doing now. And so um, I guess my message is don't quite give up yet on that sort of top-down federal uh, uh, overlay to, to all these efforts. I would also point out that even that long ago in 2001, there was recognition that the best way for the federal government to meet its own needs was through regional partnerships. Um, and so that is, that is hard baked into what the federal agencies have been mandated. Uh, and, and really this committee exists that, uh, that KNR on um, to, to see, you know, it's obvious that it hasn't gotten there. So the question is why and what can be done about that? And, and that's what we're working on. Um, so uh, two things, you know, I still think that don't give up on the federal government. I think the possibility of that overlay, and, and again, it's so important when it comes to things like, like research, both applied and theoretical, that's relevant to all this, um, to managing the wild sea resource. I think all those things, it's really important. But also there is recognition of this overlay that these things should be, really need to be carried out um, regionally and with a huge number, as many partners as, as can be brought into it, which is exactly what you're all talking about. Um, and so, uh, and there, there are examples, some old and some recent, some, you know, I mean, this effort's as recent as you can get. Um, if you want to see, first of all, I would say that the national seed strategy, which you've been hearing, hearing about a bit, I hope, um, is as thorough a prescription for what, what, a net, what all a network needs to take on. Um, so if you, if you really want to see, you know, there's, there's over 100, 115 action steps in that plan. Um, so I think it really encompasses, uh, you know, a really good picture of what, a net, what all a network needs to tackle. Um, if you want to see a very good recent uh, effort at, at constructing a network, I would recommend that you look at uh, the Nevada native plant. Um, and it was one of my slides. I, I'm not giving you the exact name, but if you, if you Google Nevada native plant initiative, something like that, you'll find it. And it's a very it's a very good document, a very good example of how partnering from federal level all the way down, including uh, the commercial sector, is resulting in, uh, in a pretty thorough plan that even has now a business plan that spells out what kind of dollars are needed, et cetera. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. No, and I'm glad you touched on that because I think that's, it seems weird to have research and networking brought into one umbrella, but I think in most cases that's, networking is crucial to understanding that. And, um, you know, you mentioned the, the Nevada uh, plant program. Likewise, there's the Southwest Seed Partnership uh, that I'm, I'm familiar with and folks under the Institute for Applied Ecology doing that. Uh, yeah. Also up in the Willamette Valley, Valley I think, uh, in Oregon. Um, so those are really exciting models that I think we're looking at for inspiration on how to uh, how to build this. And um, I, I wonder, just through through your various networks that you're all affiliated with, um, have you found partnerships where you've been able to leverage uh, researchers or you've been part of research on a more applied project of seed increase or, or uh, seed germination or otherwise? Um, and I wonder, folks at Chicago Botanic Garden, if you've got a comment on that. Yeah, we've done um, a lot of research for Department of Interior related to um, seed increase. Uh, in fact, I think um, some of Katie's graduate work um, was funded by Bureau of Land Management or Forest Service or both. Um, so we work with a lot of different agencies to do the kind of applied research that they need to um, answer questions about seed use. 
That's good to know. I, I hope that um, folks attending this symposium understand that a lot of what we're hoping to do is to bring all of these different parties together to share research resources and understanding uh, to answer some of the questions that have been posed. Um, I'm going to go into some of those questions that I don't expect you to have final answers on, on some of them, but I wonder what your thinking is or what research you're tapped into that might uh, begin exploring them. The first one I think relates to uh, ecoregions and um, the idea of locality, maintaining genotypes or ecotypes. Um, do you see trends across uh, how local is local, um, whether we're talking using an Omernic ecoregion like level three or four uh, to understand local uh, plant genetics, or do we have to look more at what a plant's um, ecology is, its, its dispersal mechanisms or its fruit or pollen type uh, dispersal? Are there trends you've seen across certain families that have more local dispersal or otherwise? How do we get a handle on um, knowing where to draw the boundaries for, let's say, a New England ecotype or even a Massachusetts ecotype or something like that? Jessa, do you want to leap in first or you want me to? <laughs> Feel free to take a first pass, Kay, and I'll clean okay. up. So um, there was some great work by Andy Bauer at the U.S. Forest Service who determined provisional seed zones uh, for species that we don't have um, species-specific information on seed transfer zones. And um, that is kind of our default. Uh, we start there if we don't know something about the species. I'll let Jessa talk about her dissertation research, which showed that plants with different breeding systems and different habitat special, um, specialization do differ in how far you can move their seeds. Um, and then, you know, climate change, of course, is throwing a monkey wrench into everything and um, figuring out how how we should factor that in is is a real challenge. But want to want to take it away, Jessa? Yeah, yeah, I can chime in a little here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, when looking at milkweeds, um, I did look at uh, the um, the general, uh, the Bauer framework that Kay mentioned, and it did align really well with what I saw into performance wise in swamp milkweed. Um, so I looked at multiple populations um, and performance within an eco within their region was pretty consistent. Um, so there was more, vari the variation was captured by the region as opposed to greater variation happening within between the populations of the region. For swamp milkweed, which is more of a specialist in which we have less gene flow, um, as opposed to common milkweed, as you saw in my intro slides, where um, there was, in terms of performance in the field, you that you couldn't tell the difference between Missouri, Illinois, or Minnesota. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, um, there was persistent variation in phenology later life stages. So it depends on kind of what your goals are. Um, and sometimes you can't have everything you want. Um, and we aren't going to have the answers for all the questions. Uh, definitely as we move into uh, climate informed seed sourcing. I think what's most important as we've been talking about is just having a source known, a source identified seed, and then um, allowing land managers to make the choices that's best for their parcel. Um, I don't know if others have things to add there. I think one thing to point out is this is kind of a, a push and pull with the industry who produce seed. They would like much larger seed zones. You know, you Obviously, they'd like to sell their seed to more areas, um, whereas the ecologists tend to maybe focus sometimes too finely on local adaptation and how important it is. And so finding that common ground between, you know, that's going to work for the ecology of the species and is also going to be feasible for people to produce um, plant material at scale um, is, is also a challenge. Well, I'm going to throw a monkey wrench into this whole conversation because over the last, ever since doing that survey of, of users in the East and working with Dr. Sarah Tangren, who did all, all the uh, statistical analysis on it, I've, I've had a personal epiphany about the seed supply and where we are. I've been at this for 20, 30 years. And you know, the bit, the biggest uh, take home message from that survey was that uh, somewhere over 70% of 725 respondents said they wanted to use uh, local ecotypic materials. Mm -hmm. 
And we did not try to define for them what was local and say, you know, just whatever you think is local, uh, is that what you want? So overwhelmingly, they said that's what they wanted. And then we asked them, could they get what they wanted? And similarly, 75% of them said they couldn't, however they defined local. Uh, for instance, if you're a state agency, you're just as likely as not to define local as the state, which of course is absurd, but that's <laughs> what they do. Um, so we didn't get in the middle of that, you know? So there's a reality out there. Everybody wants local ecotypic material and no one can get it. And guess what? We've been doing this for what, 20, 30 years? And so the dirty little secret in the room is that everybody who's out there doing projects, when push comes to shove, especially large projects, and I commend all of you who are doing your more localized efforts and, and at, a, at that kind of scale, but every project that's gone out there in the last 30 years, the dirty little secret is, is when push came to shove and they had to put plants in the ground, they got the material from wherever they had to get it. Um, and so the reality is, is that for 20 or 30 years, I have to assume reasonably that the vast majority of the material we're putting out into the landscape, and I'm talking about restoration work and land management work, has been maladapted to some extent. You know, And so we can wait another 20 or 30 years for the science to try and catch up um, and inform us in the way that we all wanted to. But you know what? There's there's over 14,000 taxa in the United States. Okay, how many seed transfer zones do we have out of 14,000 taxa? Per species or in total? I think there's about 40 seed transfers, provisional seed transfer zones. Um, no, I mean. Not, not all taxa span right. you know, the entire well, continent. Good, but, good enough, yeah. 40 out of 1,400 or 14,000, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, the epiphany for me is that uh, what I am interested in now and just uh, alluded to this a bit is that um, go, the, as an entity that's going out and making seed collections and wanting to make that seed as widely available as possible, first of all, for me, it's critical to uh, um, to source identify, if you will, that where that seed come, comes from. And so, you know, we can geo-reference every collection we make and we can reasonably let the end user, the consumer know where that is from. I would, I would not say we would pinpoint it to the exact location. We wanna protect populations, um, but we, we can certainly let them know within what county in a state they came from, maybe what township even from within a county it came from. And that coupled with, uh, as Jess also said, you know, uh, hoping that the end user is, is as informed or wants to be as informed as, as possible about the specific uh, ecology of the habitat that they're planting into um, would, with those two pieces of information, I am much more focused now going forward on relying on a well-educated consumer um, and presenting as much of that information uh, to the end user, to the consumer, so that when they have to make that very hard decision as to what they're gonna put in the ground, they can make the best informed decision they can. And until we get to the point where we have all this hard information um, that's going to tell us in a more specific way, you know, I'm faced with the decision, uh, do I want to be the native seed cop or do I want to be the native seed educator? Um, and yeah, I'm not going to try and be the cop, <laughs> you know. Uh, right. And, and I think it's it's been said by others in the chat, but it's true. I think we want to start working on this with, again, best practices, with a good understanding yeah. of the knowledge we have in put into practice with actually producing seed that is at least source identified and is of, no, of known ecoregion and known species identified accurately and cleaned well and of high quality. And those standards, I think, do need to increase. But in the meantime, we do have a, a void to fill, I think, with the simple uh, lack of material that is out there. Yeah, uh, as you as you identified. Um, and, and so, like, frankly, if if, if we need to go through the formal process, for instance, for a state agency to to certify 
our seed as as a seed bank, we can do that, you know. But uh, many of you don't, you know. Do you? I would prefer that you would trust an entity like Marsby to be ethical about and upfront about where its seed was sourced from. Um, that that's what you will make your decisions based on. Mm -hmm. If yeah, and, and um, just because there are also, I think, a lot of other questions to consider, I wonder how you, uh, everyone on this panel, uh, might approach shifting ecoregions and shifting boundaries and shifting species. Um, just speaking genetically, what, what makes sense as far as covering ecoregions to then pool together in one, in one founder plot or, or seed increase plot? Um, what, what is your basic thinking about that as it relates to the practical uh, implications of you know, seed increase? How do we deal with changing climates and shifting ecoregions and, and shifting zones? Well, I, I don't know. Do I have the ability to share screen? <laughs> We're going to just keep it to discussion for now. Um, okay. Well, there's a group that I've cited for a very long time called the uh, Great Basin Native Plant Initiative. Um, and, you know, whether we want to call them a network or not is, we can leave it. And <laughs> anyway, the Great Basin Nation, uh, Native Plant Initiative covers a very large area of the dry West, multiple states or parts of states. And, you know, they've come together for a very long time and, and there must be, I don't know, okay, 50 to 100 participants in that initiative. Um, they include, you know, a lot of federal partners, but also a lot of state partners. They include some growers and, you know, they're spread out across a great deal of the Great Basin. And so they are using uh, all those land-based resources to help delineate seed transfer zones within the Great Basin. Uh, so they're using the techniques that are used for that, which is, um, uh, Oh boy, dead brain. <laughs> Common garden studies. <laughs> Common garden studies and reciprocal garden studies, uh, primarily, you know, to evaluate materials. And they've come up with a very complex map and, and elevation and, and uh, moisture uh, are real strong factors in, in the Great Basin. So there, there's like 30 or 40 subzones. Um, but one of the other things that they've come to realize is that they have these throughout the, the region, throughout the network, if you will, they have these land-based resources, many of them uh, either college institutions or some of them are plant material centers, et cetera, et cetera. Those same resources I, I would contend can be used to start monitoring and collecting actual data on shifting populations. Right, um, yeah. And of course, that's going to take. You, I'm actually going to just ask if we can hear from from Kay and from Katie uh, on this in particular. But I appreciate the reference. Folks have uh, added that map to the chat. Yeah, I, I'm pro mixing in a production um, setting. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for having a really genetically diverse seed source that's going out in a changing climate and letting those propagules kind of sort it out amongst themselves. There are a few instances where I'm not pro-mixing, and that would be um, when there's uh, ploidy differentiation between populations um, in a species. A lot of asters and grasses have populations that are different ploidy levels, and if you mix those, you're gonna have trouble. Um, but uh, I, I am, um, in, in most cases, I, I think if you have enough genetic diversity, from a regional pool, um, you'll probably do do fairly well. Uh, different what uh, ploidy? Um, so, like, um, how many sets of chromosomes plants have? Uh, so, most most organisms are diploid; they have two sets of chromosomes. But there's also polyploids that have multiple sets, and um, in a lot of grasses and asters, we see those polyploids. Okay, can I ask you a question? based on what you just said. Yep. Do you how, how do you think big agency, state or federal that are doing very large projects and are, are writing, you know, really strict scope uh, specs for those projects and purchasing materials, would they accept the risk involved in what you just said? 
It's a great uh, question. Um, uh, when, when these sources are mixed, either in a restoration or in a production field, you have um, sterility of the offspring and, you know, kind of instant failure. And so I think you need to be really careful in, in that case. And um, I don't know, maybe Katie knows, um, as he worked on some of the penstemons with ploidy differences, how often agencies are looking at this. Do you know, Katie? Um, I think it's probably less like with the research required to determine that. I think that can probably be a barrier to actually accessing that information sometimes. Um, and I know there are instances like you described, Kay, where um, different populations with different ploides were mixed and the offspring were sterile and that happened with a penstemon species. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not aware that it's like, yeah, yeah something that a lot of people are looking into. Yeah, so I don't have an answer, Ed, on how you write the specs yeah. for that. <laughs> well, I mean, what, what these agencies are most concerned with is short-term establishment. Unfortunately, if they're monitoring, they're monitoring, you know, one, two, three, if you're lucky, five years. So what they're most concerned about is establishment. So I think, I think rather about, long-term adaptation, it would be great if they were focusing on that, but frankly, you know, they want to know that that planting is going to be there in a year or two. Um, so well, if we're... That's a, good, that's a good question. I want to ask, ask another one since we only have so much time. I'm wondering about recalcitrant or maybe unorthodox seeds. Um, we've talked a lot, I think, during this uh, symposium about primarily herbaceous plants and some uh, semi-woody or shrubby plants. But I know there are a lot of tree species, such as oaks and others, that uh, we have a difficult time maintaining uh, either seed volume of or um, genetic diversity with. Um, through your various roles, have you how have you worked with recalcitrant species, and do you see uh, a workaround for um, you know maybe longer term storage concerns about some of those? Yeah, we've turned largely to living collections for recalcitrant seeded things, and we do those mostly in a, a meta collection way. So it's not all at our garden, um, particularly with oaks. They're big. You can't have a thousand at a single garden, um, or at least at most gardens. And they're, they're also promiscuous. They hybridize with other oaks fairly easily. And so, you know, um, either having um, just a few and doing planned crosses between gardens or, you know, uh, in a field setting, a kind of gene field gene bank is the way to go, I think, for some of uh, those kinds of species. Sure. Um, I think one please. other possible solution just is that, you know, obviously on top of it, you know, oaks mast. And so uh, when they're gonna be out there is, you know, very dicey also. Uh, the other side of the coin is just doing a much better job of getting uh, end users to identify their needs well in advance so that, um, especially when it comes to recalcitrant species, that, that growers and seed banks alike can plan for those needs better because yeah. they're so spotty a resource. Yeah, one that comes to mind is uh, with the Spartinas and specifically Spartina alternaflora that I think, you know, has to be stored in salt water and can only be stored that way for about a year. And it's a challenge to get it in quantity uh, at the right time. That's a big part of the right seed, the right place, the right time. It's having that in advance, as you say, Ed. Um, well, a question that came up through the chat, and I wonder how the panelists will take, take this. And um, this may be the last one, so uh, feel free to harp on this. Um, <laughs> Folks have mentioned that they think uh, the real focus should be on native species and less on ecotypes, um, that the plants will just naturalize and become uh, part of a system uh, over time anyway, and that we shouldn't take that as seriously. Um, why do you feel it is important to have these ecoregional collections or ecotypic collections uh, that go beyond just the native species? I often use the example in talks about ecotypes or genotypes that, you know, uh, Canada goldenrod is, is of one genotype in Maine and not at all the same if you're going to uh, North Carolina with the same species. 
Um, so yeah, it's a native species, but it is adapted to its place. Um, anyway, I wonder how you think about this um, and changes through time that might affect that plant. Yeah, I was starting to reply to that comment by typing, but I'll, I'll do it this way. It'll be easier. Um, you know, I do agree native first. And when I look at restoration happening out West, um, when seed goes down after a wildfire or um, in large, um, large scale restoration, right now only about 60% of those are native species, let alone locally adapted. Most of them are not. Um, most of them are cultivars of native species. And so there's room, so much room for improvement if we can just get to native. Um, but I think there are a lot of good reasons to try to do even better than that and to get um, ecotypes that are from your region because they are, uh, in theory, adapted um, to your climate, your soils. They're likely to persist longer. They're likely to do better. And they're less likely to hybridize and cause outbreeding depression in local natural populations. From the genetic standpoint, Jessa or Katie, do you want to comment on that? Well, I'll just, I, I feel like I'm echoing or um, embodying Jeremy Fant when I say this, but um, <laughs> genetic diversity is one of the components of biological diversity. So when we lose genetic diversity, we're losing biodiversity, just as when we're losing species. So. Yeah, I agree with that. And I know of example, and at least one example where um, an echinacea species was declining at a site and um, non same ecotype um, seed was introduced of that same species and probably likely genetically swamped the original um, ecotype of that echinacea that was present at the site because the species was, was no longer declining, but um, the original genetics of that remnant population may have been lost when seed was introduced from the same species that was growing in a different habitat, for example. So yeah, I agree. So I'll, I'll, pose a question that I pose, you know, I, I ran a nursery for the state of New York for 25 years and I was embedded within the Department of Natural Resources. So my colleagues were all doing planting and restoration. And I constantly asked the question, are you doing sophisticated horticulture or are you doing ecological restoration? <laughs> um, and, you know, the reality is, is that all conservation is local and, um, what we put in the ground has consequences for the health and long-term uh, viability of local populations, especially as we further fragment and lose uh, natural uh, populations. Um, there are significant genetic consequences to what we do. And, you know, what this is all about in my, especially as, you know, we face the wholesale collapse of biodiversity on the planet, um, and, and as Doug Ptolemy says, backyards may be hugely important. Um, uh, as I'm arguing with my colleagues on my committee, uh, so-called uh, marginal lands on agricultural fields are really important. Um, they may be important uh, migratory uh, corridors. They, they may be really important to restore to habitat, but it's what's the habitat around you? And as Jess said, part of that is the genetic makeup. Um, so are we interested in sophisticated horticulture or are we, are we interested in trying to save the wild natural world? And that's where we've gotten ourselves to in 2022. So I think it's extremely critical. I, I appreciate all of those reflections, and I, I do feel like it's important for people to understand that there is no um, dichotomy around good or evil in, in this regard, but that it is a spectrum from just trying to do better by what serves biodiversity, genetic diversity, and the overall function of ecological systems. Um, so, you know, I think we all see the areas for improvement in the native seed supply chain, um, both to quantity and quality issues. Um, and I appreciate you all for, for speaking about that. Um, so we'll wrap up this panel and I just wanna give a great thanks to, um, to Jessa, to Katie, to Ed and to Kay uh, for joining us. Um, and I, I hope we continue to collaborate on these research questions as uh, we put this seed into into practice um but thank you very much for your time thank you
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, um, I think the last thing we're going to do is just uh, close this out with a little bit of a summary of um, what we've we've heard about and what the next steps are for uh, Native Plant Trust, for this network, and for the seed we care so much about. Uh, so let me just get my screen shared here. We can talk about that. Okay. Can you all see my slides? Good, good. Okay. So I, I guess we bury the lead, but I, but we do want to lead up to this point, um, which is we've we've obviously heard over these two days uh, from a variety of people that have spent lifetimes in this field, um, devoted to uh, to native species, devoted to uh, ecological uh, balance and restoration, and um, both at the home garden scale as well at the habitat uh, restoration scale, um, and the goal of the work we're doing with Native Plant Trust is to bring all of these people together under one umbrella so that there is a means of communicating uh, about what uh, seed is needed, where, at what time, uh, to address the national seed strategy, uh, as well as to understand who the different players are in this region as it relates to uh, seed collection, seed use, seed increase, and seed research. Um, so that is the reason for all of these different uh, speakers from a variety of locations and disciplines um, is and simply is informing the seed strategy we build for the Northeast. Um, and the reason we're focused on the Northeast and not specifically New England as a political boundary is because of the eco-regional focus of this. So we are um, just as focused on covering the eco-regions of New England uh, as a means of ensuring genetic diversity and uh, species uh, uh, relevance in, uh, in home use and in ecological use. Um, so we're trying to focus on what ecologically makes sense as opposed to drawing lines that are hard bump, hard, hard boundaries at the uh, state borders. Anyway, um, the focus uh, of the past two days, I hope, has led up to us trying to, to reach some of the goals that I'm going to talk about. Um, among them is establishing who the many seed users and producers are in this region. Um, so we've heard from a variety of people that I think have different roles in the process, um, and we hope to bring them all together. Um, we have seen and heard about other seed networks, uh, such as the one in Nevada that was brought up recently, um, such as the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank and the Greenbelt Native Plant Center. A lot of folks out on the West Coast in, in, uh, in Oregon, the Willamette Valley, um, all of these different networks that are doing something similar so that we don't have to invent the wheel uh, again just, just to do this in the Northeast. So we've taken inspiration from that as well as the, the past, um, just in terms of Native Plant Trust. So for those of you that don't know, we've now spent uh, over 30 years working to um, fill a seed bank of rare and endangered plant species seed for their augmentation and restoration. And we've learned a lot about the process of maintaining seed viability and storage and uh, simple conditions of doing that. Um, likewise, we have a nursery in Asami Farm that does a lot with germination regimes and protocols, understanding how to go about seed collection and seed, uh, and seed growing. Um, so we do have a lot of experience in that regard, and this is really putting it into action, uh, not so much at the individual species scale, but trying to focus on entire habitats and, uh, and think that way about uh, ecological work. Um, so we are hoping this is the catalyst for establishing a native seed network in this region um, that I hope many of you will be part of and continue to stay engaged with. Um, we were fortunate enough to receive uh, some funding from several grants as well as uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to put on this symposium, to bring these speakers out today and yesterday, um, and to begin the process of initial wild seed collections and founder plots or uh, seed increase plot construction. Um, so among these goals for this, uh, for this network are to establish seed species to be collected and grown, uh, to establish those priority species among others. Um, it's worth noting that there have been some networks that have met um, the Eco Ecological Health Network that Eve Allen uh, spoke about and is working with uh, has definitely helped to identify some of the players that uh, Native Plant Trust is now, <clears throat> now in contact with. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, but uh, we hope that, that they will stay involved and that we'll be able to build that network uh, for this region. We want to know what people, uh, what role people would like to take in this, um, whether you're with a land trust or with a restoration project or a home homeowner or a private gardener. 
uh, you're welcome in this group. And I think we have a lot to, to share and to learn as far as resources and questions to ask and seed to uh, seed to share ultimately at some point. Um, one thing we are trying to do uh, at Native Plant Trust is to educate folks about the need for seed as the symposium has been focused on. Uh, but also to do research into uh, genetic diversity, to understand seed, seed collection uh, protocols and how they might be refined over time and how seed can be produced at the scales needed. Um, so with some of the grant funding that we received, we are in the process, as I speak to you, of building out at Nisami Farm, uh, a seed drying uh, room and a room specifically for drying and cold storage, as well as for larger scale processing uh, and, uh, and for um, ultimately cleaning and propagation. Um, all of this increase in scale is focused on trying to serve this greater regional need uh, for the seed network. Um, so that is, that is the hope. Um, we, we hope to put in touch folks that have um, ongoing projects with those who have seed and to basically unite the two under one uh, common goal. Um, and likewise, we want to, uh, you know, talk to both private and public land managers. We want to focus not just on nonprofit use of seed, but also commercial nurseries that want to be part of this, um, ultimately to increase both the the supply, uh, the quantity, as well as the quality of seed uh, by trying to understand what best practices are out there for collection, for cleaning, for storage, uh, for viability testing, uh, to make it a better source in general uh, that we can share with people. Um, we are going to be hiring uh, starting uh, the end of this year and into 2023 uh, seed collection teams that will focus at least next year on uh, a variety of different sites for some of those initial seed collections uh, that should be as eco-regionally and genetically diverse as possible to bring into uh, seed increase plots that uh, we'll have and that others will have in this kind of satellite mosaic of different uh, growers and producers and land trusts that want to convert land into this. Um, specifically too, we're trying to engage those that haven't been part of this conversation in the past and um, we'll be reaching out to uh, underrepresented and underserved communities as it relates to botany and conservation and horticulture. Um, we intend to start the scouting next year uh, to find some of these populations if we already uh, don't aren't familiar with where they are, track their phenology and uh, make those collections. So that would be a big part of uh, next season. Um, in the same way, we hope to, uh, you know, not only identify all the different stakeholders of this network, but also the resources that I think a lot of people have been asking about. Um, Simply put, uh, we would like to put together kind of the clearinghouse for information as well as for uh, protocols, just processes to get your seed collections done, your, your plots uh, in place and maintain quality in that plot over time. Um, we want to avoid duplication. We want to be able to replicate this model and share it widely. So we are trying to make this as inclusive to different users and different uh, levels of scale as possible. Um, I don't need to go into this, but this is a bit of thinking about how all of these different pieces connect and how they're interrelated. And this is the work of Dr. Jessamine Finch, uh, who uh, thinks in these systems far better than I do, but um, has done a nice job laying this out. And uh, if, if you're checking this out later, this will be available as uh, part of the recording, and I'm happy to share slides like this at any point. Um, so some of the follow-up things, the things we'd like to do after the symposium uh, is to send out a survey to identify what the primary roles are of the folks that have attended and people that might be potential uh, network members uh, under this Northeast Seed Network. So those roles don't have to be defined as here, but they would be including of uh, kind of a diversity of different aspects, including are you a seed producer or a farmer? Are you looking to use seed for restoration, for research, for your nursery, for your private use? Um, what uh, do you, are you doing seed collections? Where are you collecting? Can we assist with those? What protocols do you use? Um, do you have a seed storage facility? Do you want to get one up and running? Uh, we have a lot of experience in that, as well as in germination and viability testing. So we want to uh, share some of what we've learned. Um, and as mentioned, uh, we're doing seed research, not just having plots uh, for the practical implications of simply getting the seed supply chain uh, increased, but also understanding how to keep that moving, keep it sustainable, and uh, make that applicable to other people. Um, we'd like to figure out a structure for uh, committees and subcommittees in this network, how species lists are derived, who's doing what and coordinating that, how to manage data, how to share data, um, and all of those pieces. So I hope as we identify who the users are and, and their roles in this network, we'll also have some structure given to 
um, committees to make decisions on those particular things that are shared more widely. Um, and then simply sharing of, of those resources I mentioned before, um, whether it's some of the foundation seed for the increased plots that others might put in or that we have going on, um, or any of these other kind of ancillary pieces that we've been talking a lot about over the past two days. Um, how do you design this plot? So how do you implement it on uh, maybe different landscapes that aren't just uh, you know, a plowed field, but also perhaps uh, a restored site after a wildfire or a former agricultural field or a home garden uh, in, the, in the city or in the middle of uh, rural landscapes? Um, how do you uh, how do we share information on uh, seed collection? What's been collected where? Using what protocols? Um, seed cleaning, testing, and storage. Um, where local is, and how you define ecoregions, uh, and who's covering what species in those ecoregions. So again, trying to consider um, you know impacts on natural systems and wild plants, and not wanting to duplicate efforts if we can coordinate that. Uh, and likewise, um, as we are doing this, this build out and increasing some of the facilities we, we have on, on offer, um, we'd like to be able to offer services such as bulk seed cleaning, uh, seed testing, uh, storage, and uh, an increase. And that can be for uh, private individuals on the small scale or for uh, habitat restoration uh, officials at the, the federal or state level. Um, so we're trying to uh, gradually ease into this, and I don't think we'll have all of these pieces figured out and uh, totally coherent by next season, but um, we are trying to move forward because we have seen this need, we're trying to address it, and um, uh, stay tuned and please con continue to stay engaged with this uh, this network. Um, we will follow up with you, but I, I welcome you and others to reach out to, uh, to Uli or myself at any point. Um, Uli is the Director of Horticulture and uh, is based at Garden in the Woods, uh, as am I, though I am in the Conservation Department. Um, Uli, is there anything you want to add that I didn't mention in closing? Um, about the work we're doing? <clears throat> no, just to, again, to thank all of our speakers and our panelists over the past two days for, I think, really putting together a, a, a comprehensive and uh, uh, an in-depth look at um, this regional effort to, to make this kind of plant material more available. And I think, and just to you know, judging from what some of the folks in the chat have said that, you know, this is a pretty big effort. There's a great deal of complexity here, uh, but I feel really confident that the sort of shared enthusiasm and energy and passion that has been on display today will carry us forward to, to learn from the process as much as possible, to put forth a, a really, uh, um, uh, you know, positive and welcoming message around the need for this work to be done um, and that our community can uh, welcome increasingly more people with open arms. Um, and so to that, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you to the generous support from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I want to thank again um, the team behind the scenes here to help make sure this event ran as smoothly as possible with Bess Popek and Stephen Kiley in our public programs uh, department. Thank you both. Um, thank you to the staff of Native Plant Trust for the support and making all this happen. And a big thank you to all of you that tuned in today. Uh, and then I hope that you are leaving this as um, enthused and energized about the future and hopeful about the future as I am. Um, so please do stay in touch. Um, we will have, as Michael said, some more materials to send out to everybody in terms of surveys and resources that were shared in the chat. And once we have a moment to catch our breaths and, um, um, you know, edit the recordings a little bit, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be putting all of that again too. And then just uh, Bess is just putting that in here to do so that, yes, we, we will be getting back in touch and please stay in touch with us. Uh, either Michael or I are happy to carry these conversations forward. Um, and um, thank you all. Thanks for spending two days, for, uh, um, two days with us. And with yeah, that, and it's worth noting that even if you're not involved just passively, um, keep stay tuned for staff positions to work on some of this uh, that we hope will be well paid and uh, and a great experience for anybody involved. Um, yeah. So stay tuned for that as well.
And, and thank you to Fish and Wildlife Service for making this uh, available to everybody at uh, no cost. That was largely because of their sponsorship. Indeed. So. Indeed. All right. Well, with that, then we'll uh, we'll end things here, and um, maybe we'll keep the the chat alive for just a little bit longer to capture any last uh, last sentiments. But um, thank you. We look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, everybody. See you.